My name's uh, David Pearson, and I'm co-chair of this uh, the steering committee for this group, uh, along with um, with uh, Susan Furman. And uh, it's a treat for me to introduce our second panel, which is going to focus on uh, process data, uh, the kind of data that, as Andrew outlined in his overview, um, it, we associate with uh, learning, particularly online learning environments and the like. Uh, we have uh, four panelists. Uh, our panel chair is uh, Constance Steinkuller, who's professor of digital media at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, where her work has focused on the role of games on the development of a whole range of human outcomes, including reasoning, achievement, literacy, attention, and social and emotional well-being. Um, uh, uh, we also have Ken Kadinger, a professor of human-computer interaction and psychology at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, apropos of today, um, uh, Ken's uh, role is as director of Learn Lab, uh, where he has for many years conducted research on programs designed to um, uh, uh, promote online learning through uh, personalized tutoring. Zach Pardos is my colleague at UC Berkeley, uh, where he holds appointments in both the Graduate School of Education and what we now call the iSchool, which is the School of Information. Zach's work, is, work focuses on a range of uh, big data is, issues, including data mining, digital learning environments, and machine learning. And what I find very fascinating, using process data that we get from learning environments as a formative assessment tool uh, to improve both learning and teaching. Uh, David Yaskin uh, comes to the big data table uh, from the perspective of an entrepreneur and software developer. Uh, his uh, initial foray uh, was on a, um, a modest little project uh, that came to be known as Blackboard, where he uh, formed the, the startup and, and strategy for uh, promoting that company from the ground up for uh, till uh, it reached uh, uh, a total of 2,700 institutional customers. He founded a, a student success-oriented um, software named Starfish, which grew to 300 institutions prior to its sale to Hobson's, where, where and David went to Hobson's uh, with Starfish. Uh, he told me, and uh, when I first met him today, that he's actually, this is his last week at Starfish. So if any of you are interested in an entrepreneur who's just itching for a new project, uh, uh, David's uh, your, your go-to guy for that. Uh, so uh, now let me turn things over uh, to Constance and um, uh, we'll begin this session. Thank you. Uh, as panel chair, I really want to spend most of the time uh, being able to feature the talks of the speakers we have here today on process data, but I did want to make a few general comments to start. Um, about the nature of process data and the public conversation that actually is driving much of the policy work or policy thinking, or in some cases, lack of thinking um, around privacy and data and children and personalization and devices in particular. Um, my own work, I study interactive media and games. I look at them both commercial games and I look at games for impact across a variety of sectors and have been doing this for a while. Um, you know, and much of the conversation around data and process data in that space is really focused on um, assessment data, but really kind of under the rubric of the promise of formative assessment. So, you know, in a very general sense, uh, thinking that devices may be one way in which we can scale notions of formative assessment where we're looking at process and being able to be more diagnostic and more um, responsive to the needs of a learner uh, when it matters, as an earlier speaker pointed out, when we can still do something about um, confusion, misperceptions, failures, et cetera, rather than after the fact. Um, you know, but those formative assessments, whether or not we've actually made good on them is a different question. I think in many ways, um, in my own experience working with big data that's both quant quantitative and trying to use partially quantified qualitative data like talk data, um, you know, the, the work of analyzing data is slow and laborious and having immediate feedback on systems while kids are on games, we're really not there yet. Um, and so there's this sort of promise of formative assessment that we actually haven't delivered on yet, though we're getting closer, and some of the work that we have featured today 
shows us that we're getting very close in some examples. Um, but really, you know, that, that data can either inform assessing programs, which has been a majority of the conversation here, or it can be used to assess kids, right? Two different ways to think about those, uh, what it is that we're evaluating. But in either case, I think that we have to be honest with ourselves in certain respects about the consequential validity of what we do, and to put, to put it in Essex terms. I mean, I'm not sure that in all cases the public has been persuaded or that we necessarily have made a persuasive case for the fact that research on data, whether it's looking at kids or, in my case, or looking at programs, has actually improved education. And I think that we do have compelling examples, but. I don't know that they've actually gotten outside of the education community as well as they could and should have. And in my experience, that public conversation is, what, again, what drives policy. So um, making that case, that case clear, I think, ought to be part of our agenda here. And that includes the work of people that are in this room. Um, but I do think that Roy P. called it correctly when he said technology is a great amplifier. Um, and I think the systems that are currently in place in our public school systems, we have an incredible regime of assessment. Um, and there are lots of different views about how that assessment regime in public schools is working out for people. Technology acts as an amplifier in that it can either increase transparency or it can increase opacity. And we have to make choices about what we're going to have it do. It can either increase equity or it can increase inequity. And right now, um, you know, as much as I like to be optimistic about public schools, which I am committed to, I don't know that the systems in place are actually equitable, nor is there good data to support, that we're fixing problems of equity in terms of race specifically and class specifically. And so concerns about privacy, in my view and my experience, tend to be a way to gently refer to without getting into the nuts and bolts of the fact that when you have a large institution that may not have a history of equity in terms of class and race, um, that uh, increasing assessments, increasing forms of data, particularly data that's not just from moments in time but moments of process of what a kid does or doesn't do, how a kid is engaged or not engaged, looking at minutia, like the kind of work that I do, I think that that actually does, uh, may, may actually be part of sort of the reaction of the public to things like in bloom and other processes, right? Um, and I think we ought to be responsive to it. I don't think we should shy away about it, but I want to raise that issue because you know, an earlier colleague asked where are parents and teacher, parents and kids in this conversation? And the truth is that many of our research questions are in no way participatory. They're in no way really driven. They're about kids. And we think about kids in their best interest. We're all in education for a reason, right? We want to improve intervention and instruction. But because it's not participatory, because it's not actually driven by the communities who are being assessed, I think that it runs the risk of the wrong so-called optics, right? But those optics are substantive, and there's a reason why we have this uh, discussion about privacy here. And I just hope uh, those comments, I'm saying that as someone who um, gathers big data sets, works with big data sets, and sees what we can actually do with them. Um, so I have a lot of optimism about the power of them in research. But I sort of want to make a broad statement about um, some of these concerns about, about privacy are actually concerns about the same mission that we're on, which ought to be about equity and transparency, too. So I'm going to hand it over to the panelists to dig into their work. And then after that, we'll do some Q&A. Okay, I'm setting my timer for 12 minutes, see how I do here. Uh, um, I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, LearnSphere project that we've been engaged in for about a year and a half, uh, which is uh, toward supporting more ethical sharing of educational data and analytic methods. It's a collaboration with MIT, Stanford, University of Memphis, and Car uh, team uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, is that the right button to press? No, that one. Okay, and some key issues, we've, we've mentioned many of these. Um, does data help us? In particular, this panel is about learning process, and um, to me, an important question there is to connect those uh, learning process student experiences with learning outcomes. Uh, 
A second key question here is, does sharing data and analytic methods accelerate our education research and putting them together particularly? And then, of course, the uh, critical issue of making collection and sharing better while we maintain uh, student privacy. Uh, in our uh, proposal for this LearnSphere project, uh, we had this figure which is uh, meant to capture some of the differences I think we've already been somewhat talking about. Uh, so we have grain size of data here, and out here in the small print you can't read is probably more like the administrative data that we just heard about in the other session. Uh, the work we've done in the past, which I'll summarize somewhat in DataShop, is, is more fine-grained data. Uh, MOOCDB is another effort I'll say a little bit more about. But I, what I wanted to emphasize, too, is that there are many different kinds of data types across these and many different, basically, research questions that we could address, uh, psychological and social and cultural ones. Um, and a key goal for us is to uh, produce discoveries not possible within what are currently too many data silos here. Um, so what are, what are we doing toward achieving that? Uh, we've uh, built what is at this moment mostly a portal which points to a number of existing resources and we'd love to point to yours if you have one. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to go through some of these here starting with DataShop. DataShop grows out of uh, 10 years of science of learning funding that we also received from NSF. Where do I point this button? I'm the wrong way. There we go. Um, and I guess one thing I like to highlight about data shop is that big often is, is sort of like the tallness of the data, but um, another way to think about big is in the fineness of the, of the records for, that are recorded um, and, and the timing of it. So we have roughly about 10 se second observations in, in data shop. Uh, the, the width is the number of different things stored, and the depth is an issue of whether there's some theoretically coding or labeling of the data. These are all important. Um, DataShop was one of the key outputs of, of Learn Lab, the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center, and a, and a major goal here was to leverage widely used educational technologies to do what we call basic research at scale, helping researchers, especially psychologists, ed educational psychologists and cognitive psychologists, get out of their labs and start working uh, on studies in schools, uh, randomized trials in schools we called in vivo experiments, but not trials on uh, products, but trials on principles, and those principles would lead to modification in the technologies and then compare whether those principles lead to better learning outcomes. And at the same time, across all these courses, just collect lots of data, uh, and DataShop has some 850 uh, data sets in it currently. Um, if you go there, there's some uh, reasonably nice documentation about what you can do with DataShop that points to existing data sets, existing papers associated with those data sets, uh, some online instructional videos. You can uh, upload your own data. Um, uh, here there are some uh, indications that you have to give around IRB and, and privacy issues that will then determine the level of access that people get. And then there are all kinds of analytic tools that are part of the website, including this learning curve tool that's illustrated. And just to dig into that uh, a little bit, when you are exploring a particular d domain, this one's uh, high school geometry, um, you can see whether the error rate learning curves are smoothly declining as students get opportunities to uh, practice, uh, so this is formative assessment in action, and individual concepts or skills, whether they're showing, you know, this is noisy, it's a re relatively small student sample, but it is declining, whereas this one's flat, and what we've discovered are techniques for, for uh, understanding how our model is wrong because of these flat curves, revising the model, getting better fits, but more importantly, use those re revisions, those model revisions to redesign the instruction and then do a random trial with the redesigned instruction compared to the existing. We've done this a number of times. This is one of the results here where uh, uh, not shown is better uh, outcomes on a, a post-assessment, but what is shown is we increased students' uh, uh, focus on the key planning skills that were embedded in this curve here that weren't being well addressed and pop up the error rate here uh, while reducing the overall time to mastery by 25%, which was a pretty large, I think, and powerful outcome. A uh, number of other uh, kinds of studies have been done. Um, uh, getting at better models of learners that uh, go beyond our intuitions and designing and deploying associated better activities, um, work on assessing uh, 
uh, affect and engagement and motivation, improving assessment. This is one connecting online data to MCAS test data, so to basically uh, administrative data. Um, similarly here, this is a, a MOOC analysis showing whether Acti doing activities versus reading or watching is more powerful, and we found a big correlational effect of doing over watching in the MOOCs. Uh, and there is an argument uh, uh, related to Larry's point about external validity in a follow-up paper here uh, uh, on how we can do correlational analysis across lots of data sets in a way that might inform external validity. Um, uh, MOOCDB is another one of the resources here. Uh, it has curation and analytic methods. Uh, as, as Andrew said, uh, curation, data cleaning is 90% of 5% of the work. I, that's very true. A lot of tools for that, but also tools for doing MOOC analysis in MOOCDB. Um, there are uh, tools available, or data available in the Stanford data stage uh, website. Uh, uh, MOOC data at the college level. This clicker is not working very well for me. Um, Discourse DB is uh, a new effort led by Carolyn Rose to get more social uh, data from discussion boards and student dialogue. And then uh, finally, uh, a key hypothesis we're exploring is that we're going to get better sharing if people can have the data infrastructure on their own website on their own server rather than on our server. Um, so th so this, the data shop at Memphis is the first instance of that. We're pointing to lots of other data repositories, but also method repositories um, and data generation tools. One key uh, observation is that all of these things seem to be one or the other and are not well integrating data and method. So in LearnSphere, we're building this uh, data flow mechanism to integrate methods with data. You can share methods for curation, for analysis, for visualization. They roughly go left to right here. They're available uh, in the menu here as they get contributed. Each one of those methods can be done in any language, so you can do your processing up here in, in Java, your, your analysis in R, and so forth. And non-programmers can then take these methods and recombine them. And there's a beta version now of this available in LearnSphere. Uh, so uh, finally, I just wanted to say a few things about privacy protection. We've talked about risks of de-identification, and I've made some categorical distinctions. One reason why we have a lot of data more publicly available or privately expanding in DataShop is it's clickstream data with no demographic information, no record information, and l no linking. You can go up to the highest level of access with that. But as you increase the risks of re-identification, uh, then, then it's not clear that you can make data publicly available. But the thing I really wanted to highlight is there's a lot of question marks in these cells about what we should be able to do, and that's what we need to be working out. And uh, a particular goal we have in the LearnSphere project is to uh, get folks together to uh, meet about and discuss these issues. Uh, so uh, we're going to do some interviews, hopefully some of you. Uh, what, what are your concerns about sharing data and how should we do privacy protection? Um, and there's a whole bunch of questions that are in these slides I, I won't take time to go through, but a number of questions that I think are important here. Uh, certainly one of them I'll highlight is that we could do more across our institutions to streamline the IRB decision process and address some of those question marks in that past diagram. So uh, my timer stopped working here, but that, let me just move to my summary slide here and say I do think we can improve education through data. We've seen a number of those examples. Uh, I think sharing Data and methods is really going to be powerful, and we need better infrastructures for doing both. Uh, and privacy management really depends on uh, re-identification risks, and we should change access privileges in accordance. We, we won't have a one-size-fits-all. Uh, we have to work out these details, and we need to better understand those details by talking together. Okay, um, as I saw my uh, as I saw my charge uh, today uh, was to introduce 
uh, briefly work uh, by collaborators and I uh, at my lab at UC Berkeley as it pertains to uh, learner process data. Uh, so the title is Knowledge Inference and the Value Proposition of the Type of Data Whose Name We Shall Not Speak, um, which I'll call process data. And actually, gladly, I'm embracing that term. It's growing on me. But I also uh, encourage constant uh, elbowing of Andrew. <laughs> so, um, so this is going to be sort of a low-level talk showing an example of learner process data and some uh, methods. Um, but a little uh, variety in that regard is probably not a bad thing. Um, OK, so what's the value proposition of process data and learning analytics? Uh, one of the value propositions is certainly um, this idea that we have a mountain of data. And it really is a mountain. Um, as Andrew pointed out, he's dealt with sifting through terabytes of data. And our Berkeley MOOC courses, uh, the most popular ones, have between 10 and 20 million actions each. So over about 40 courses, multiple years, you quickly get up to that billion marker um, of actions. So isn't there something we can learn from that? Right? Um, and if we learn something, can we then affect some kind of change? Right? Can we make suggestions to instructional design teams? Um, can we uh, make our theories about student engagement and affect more robust? Um, design better interventions, et cetera. Um, so certainly among the kind of things we would like to know, the kind of things we would like to discover from these data, um, is what is effective and for whom. So kind of effectiveness is one of the most basic questions we'd like to answer as uh, effectivity uh, as educators. And so uh, effective and for whom, um, you know, not for which learning style. We know that's been debunked. But um, prior knowledge and the importance of prior knowledge has not been debunked. So for example, in higher ed, if you know someone's coming from a computer science background, perhaps you give them material that um, resonates with that kind of background and helps them learn the current concept. And maybe there's a different set of materials if you have a physics background. So how do we get at that kind of thing? So, uh, let me dive into an example of some learner process data in a MOOC. If you have access to MOOC data, you've probably seen this a half dozen times. But um, if not, um, I think this is a salient example. So here's a problem uh, in um, the first MOOC on edX. And it's uh, asking what is the power dissipated in the resistor in watts. And the voltage source is 10 volts, and the resistance is 50 ohms. And then there's a second question being asked, what is the power entering the source in watts? So our learner, Sarah, uh, begins by answering 500, right? multiplying uh, voltage source by ohms, probably a common mistake, uh, heuristic. And we see in the log file, Sarah has interacted with lecture one, problem 1.5, spent one minute and 52 seconds before answering incorrect, and it was her first attempt at that problem. Uh, she then goes on to try to find um, some understanding about this problem, goes to a video uh, uh, in sequence one, video eight, spends 58 seconds on the video. As you see, the video is only 51, uh, 15 seconds long. So she spends some extra time looking at it, maybe pausing. Wait, Let's see, there we go. Uh, goes back to the problem, changes her answer on the first question, answers the second question at the same time, gets both of those incorrect. And as you can see, count one, it's now her second attempt at that uh, first question, and it's her first attempt at the second question. Um, so she goes to book page 27, paginates the book page 28, spends a minute 56 seconds there, sees I equals VR, uh, I equals V over R, and perhaps she's got it now. She now answers deliberately one question at a time. The first part, she changes her answer to two, that's correct, and then she changes the second part to negative two, uh, and that's correct. So two questions I want to pose here about this scenario. One 
is does behavior help predict performance or does the learner process data help predict performance, right? Does it help predict performance over um, the scenario where you only had the response data, where you only had correct and incorrect responses to questions? Does it uh, add to the predictive accuracy to know what the student did in between responses? Um, and the second question is, which resource was most effective? Uh, and I can ask you that as an educator, as maybe someone with background in this, and you can consult uh, the pedagogical material, you can look at the videos, you can look at the sequence, and you can come to a reasoned estimation of your own about the efficacy of these resources. So the question is, statistically, can we come to that conclusion, given tens of thousands of students and a variety of different sequences of correct and incorrect and resource usage? Okay, so the answer to the first one is, Yes, um, behavior does help predict performance. When we know which videos they've looked at, as opposed to not knowing that information, it does help us predict um, what problems they're gonna correct, get correct and incorrect, and we have several studies to show that. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the method used there. So which resource was most effective? Uh, this has been touched a little bit on uh, in the previous panel. This is a question of interpretation. The interpretable model, and even worse, it's really a question of causality, right? And this is observational data, so can you get at this causal question? We'd love it if you could. So let me have that question just stand out there being vulnerable and tell you I'm not going to answer it sufficiently, but I will uh, tell you about some uh, successes we've had in answering that question with other data sets. So, Inferring efficacy from process data. How do you do it? When have we done it and succeeded? Um, so we've mostly applied um, a model of learning called Bayesian knowledge tracing. Uh, Bayesian knowledge tracing is sort of a mainstay in intelligent tutoring systems uh, for estimating cognitive mastery, much like item response theory is a mainstay uh, with measurement and, form and uh, summative assessment. Um, and the model can be extended to measure individual learner effects, if you think students learn at different uh, pace, or different item level effects, um, if your organization of items into skills um, is imperfect, you'll have variability within the items within a skill, and you might want to uh, model that. So a big difference between the context that Bayesian knowledge tracing is applied in and IRT is that uh, Bayesian knowledge tracing is exclusively applied for formative assessment purposes, right? Knowing when a student has mastered something so you can adapt instruction live. So uh, let me get to when have we been able to infer efficacy from process data. So the first example um, was an experiment um, where we're trying to teach uh, students different representations of fractions, right? So pie chart, number line, and the research question being asked is, is it more effective to block the practice schedule, so all of one type of representation followed by all of another, or is it better to interleave? So this was a randomized, this was a proper random assignment, uh, pre-test, post-test, conducted by a collaborator at uh, Univers University of Wisconsin-Madison, Martina Rao. And so when you're doing learning gain analysis, looking at the difference between pre and post and doing your due diligence to make sure it's balanced at pretest, um, you ignore all the learner process data. You throw away the acquisition phase and you only look at the pretest and the post test most of the time, maybe subject treatment interactions. Um, so what we did here is say, okay, what if we only looked at the acquisition phase? Can we come to the same conclusions as the pre and post test gain study? And the answer was we could. Um, in both the pre- and post-test gain study and applying um, a model of learning to just the acquisition phase, they both came to the conclusion that interleave was better than blocked uh, with about the same effect size. And this was in spite of the interleave condition having an interference effect, where it's actually lower percent correct in the interleave condition. Um, a second instance of this was uh, in a system called uh, assessments, uh, where um, students were given questions in a random order that had a random tutorial strategy. So if you answered a question wrong, you were given a random strategy. It was either tutored problem solving, where it broke a problem down into steps. It was worked example, where it showed uh, a solution to a similar problem. 
or it was a solution. It showed the solution to the problem that you're solving. Right? So the research question was, what kind of help do you want? What kind of help will be most effective to students? So why were we able to infer things in these two examples, which were not exactly pertaining to traditional controlled experiments? Uh, in the first example, there was random assignment. Uh, and in the second example, uh, there was random tutorial help treatment. So there was randomization in both instances that we were able to leverage and come to conclusions. So when it comes to this MOOC case and which resource was most effective, what's in the way? A lot of it's already been talked about today. But one thing that's in the way is there's a lack of controlled randomization, right? There's self-selection bias present. Um, also, it's been found that resource use is negatively correlated with ability. So if you're trying to predict performance based on research, uh, resource use, and you're training, let's say, a l linear model, you'll find that the coefficients for that linear model are negative, that resource usage is negatively correlated with performance. That's bad if you're trying to interpret your model and say, this resource is good, this resource is bad, instructional team, go. Um, so one thing that we did find uh, that's a big confounder, and that's where you want to start often, is find what uh, unidentified confounders there might be, is you have to realize that in MOOC data, it's different than residential data. Over 60% of students have a bachelor's or higher. Okay? So that means very high prior knowledge. So prior knowledge is a major confounder. That is, it's not that the resources are bad, and that's why they have a negative coefficient. It's that students who need the help most are the ones who are seeking it. So they're self-identifying. Uh, sorry, I did this with timing saved. Um, they're self-identifying as low students, right? But if you control for prior knowledge, that is, take into account different priors based on the level of education they've stated, you get a better fitting model and a little bit better interpretive model. But what's the validity of these estimates? Can we say we know what works and for whom? If you have a bachelor's degree or higher, uh, you should do this resource. If you have um, if you're in high school, you should do this resource. We don't right now have a great way of validating this, so it's an open question. There's propensity score matching. Um, experimentation could be done. We could have an intervention based on our assumptions here, see if the intervention works. That might be a source of validity. Um, and there's a whole community in machine learning called interpretable machine learning that's looking for solutions to this kind of question. Okay, and I'm going to sort of wrap up with frontiers here. Um, and this slide is sort of the case for why large data is required for certain approaches. Um, it's been a long, well, since 2013, long-standing result that's um, much advertised in natural language processing that <clears throat> by looking at millions of words from news articles or news broadcast corpus, um, you can learn a semantic structure uh, without any other information other than the sequence of those words. And so the really fantastic result that keeps on being repeated is you learn the mapping of these words to a point in Euclidean space. So king has a point, queen has a point, man, woman has a point in this Euclidean space, this high dimensional space. If you take the word king you know, and that representation, that point in space, and you subtract the word man, the representation of man, you will get to some other point in the space, a transform in the space, and the closest word to that transform position in space is queen. That's very cool. Um, and this same idea can be applied um, to education for finding deeper representations of knowledge. And here are some examples. We've done our own early stage work, um, and there's existing work that's comparing BKT to neural network approaches, but these approaches require large amounts of data. So what are the takeaways here? Um, there is a demonstrable benefit to be had for students uh, in using learner process data. And there is an opportunity cost to prohibiting this kind of research, right? And it's a cost that will be borne by the students. I also want to point out that none of the studies in uh, this research required PII. Um, there is a, a larger conversation to be had about what privacy is, um, if it is uh, a student's ability to control their identity and what implications that has for um, the kinds of research we do, but I'll leave that for perhaps a later discussion. Thanks.
Hi, everybody. Um, name's David Yaskin. I'm going to start out with excuses. So I am a practitioner, not a researcher. I got a bachelor's, and I think I had a B minus average. Um, so I am a little intimidated, which is such a great group. Um, and the second excuse is I was told yesterday, I think at 2 or 3 o'clock, that I'm going to be presenting for Al Essa, who's a great guy who did a much better job. Um, but what I want to tell you all is that I actually want you to work harder and smarter because your work is really necessary. And so in the last few years, as you heard, I worked at this startup that had 50 customers Blackboard, and then I left when they had 2,700, and all of a sudden e-learning was starting to become more mainstream. And I'll just share this with you. We didn't know what we were doing, but we created an e-learning revolution. Then I started a company called Starfish around student success, which is how you can get counselors and tutors and advisors to basically understand what's happening to students in the classroom, outside the classroom, and have a bigger impact. And we got to 5 million students, right? Very popular system that's being used. Now there are a lot of other systems that do that. So there's a ton of activity going on that you can impact. And the second thing is your work is really important because I just think this needs to be stated anytime educators come together. So, you know, the Gates Foundation, when I first went to their offices, said the single thing that you can do to um, impact transgenerational poverty so that if you're poor, your kids aren't also poor, is to make sure that the mom has a college education. But what we know is today, I think it's for um, people 24 and below, if you're in the quarter, or the poorest quarter, then 8% of you have a college degree, but it's like 80% for the top, right? So it's our job as really smart people in education to make that different so that more poor people get college degrees so that we can eliminate poverty and have better lives. So that's what you all have the potential doing. And what's happening, which I think some people know, but they don't realize, is that you know, these learning management systems, when I left nine, 10 years ago, we had 13 million students we were supporting in higher education. And maybe we had 10% of them, but now the advances with publisher tools and gamification systems and MOOCs and these clicker systems and these video capture systems that have lectures and then watch the students watch the lectures, they're all collecting more and more data. They're more and more pervasive. The systems that we built at Starfish, and you know, we have other folks here, Civitas and Everfi, are supporting these advisor counselor students. All of these systems start out honestly with collection. They're collecting data. But then the second thing that they do is they actually present and organize the data. So they take the data that's happening about the students. And so this can be demographic data, for example, for systems we have, what's happening inside the classroom, what are students doing to seek help, what are their academic plans, what are their other plans. And they present all that information to this individual that can help the student. But as time goes on, we realize, wait, it's not just about presenting information. It's about making predictions, and that's why predictive analytics is so popular. And so most of these learning management systems, these student success systems now, are basically giving advice to the staff about how students can make those choices. And you know, what are the student choices? What, what am I, what, you know, they have to understand, what are the interests, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses? So which college should I go to? Which career should I follow? Which program should I get involved in? Which courses should I take? How do I do these assignments? How do I learn the material? How do I write that essay? All of these decisions are being made, and there are all of these people at the colleges and universities that are helping make those decisions. But they now have more and more these tools, the software that's not a dashboard, it's actually a workplace. It's saying, here are your students in aggregate and individually, and we know a lot about those students. The institution provided that data to those vendors that then provide it back to that staff. So they understand inside and outside the classroom what's happening, and organizations are starting to make predictions. But here's the key thing. Knowing the prediction, and this is what Andrew said, and I really respect it, of sort of what might happen to the student, right? Which is the degree that you might follow? Which is the course that you might take? Isn't necessarily good advice. Because that's not necessarily the path that we want. We don't want necessarily students taking the easiest course and the simplest program. And so what we need to do is take the research that you're doing, validated what decisions really help the student achieve the outcomes that they're looking for, and provide it into the hands of these 100,000 
staff members outside the classroom and even more, hundreds of thousands of instructors so they can make better decisions supporting that student. Because what's happening now is they're basically making their decisions based on whatever they've learned, whatever research they're able to read. And I am out there in the community colleges and the regional universities that are very different from your schools. And staff have very little time to read the research. So what we have to do is we have to build into the software the lessons that you're learning so that while I have a student in front of me, it can help me not just use my own experience, my own training, but use the knowledge that we have as a community. So that creates challenges, though. So how can we gather that information, but that's becoming easy, easier? How can we organize that information? But ultimately, what I think is the most exciting, and this is, if anyone you're familiar with the PAR organization, it was started by the Gates Foundation, um, where recently Hobson's partnered and acquired the assets of PAR, is that their mission really was to organize and collect information about what interventions outside the classroom are happening and to share that at the system level. And then over time, look at the data around how those interventions are being used and what the efficacy of those are. So the infrastructure for collecting the information, putting it in the hands of decision makers that are helping students as well as the students themselves, and then cross-institutional sharing is getting stronger and stronger. And we're really just waiting for the research to guide us but not breaking the privacy of the student and making sure ethics is considered. Okay, well, we have been very, very efficient on this panel, and we have finished with a little uh, uh, time to spare. That gives us more time for our our conversation. So the floor is now open uh, for questions and commentary from the audience. And my colleague, Susan Furman, has the first opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, Zach, I'm trying to square your um, ability to do all these studies with no personally identifiable information and Andrew's MOOC case where the increasing anonymization actually distorted the data set. So how, how is that? Uh, probably uh, two things can reconcile that. Uh, one is the data, uh, the analyses were conducted on Berkeley data. So as a PI at Berkeley, I do have access to the identifiable data from Berkeley, right? So the, the problem comes uh, with K anonymity when you have to sort of permute the data uh, to an extent where it has marginal research utility. Right. Uh, you only need to do that when you want to make the data public, right? So m my analyses did not require that the Berkeley data be made public. It was made available to me through our IRB protocol, um, and I have to safeguard it. Um, so just following up. Yeah. So th does that link to what Ken's sort of meta solution is, which is controlled access? I mean, is that is that the ultimate answer here, which is that uh, it's who the researcher is and the conditions under which the research is done rather than any sort of agreement about when the data is collected. You can? Well, I, uh, I guess what I meant to illustrate in that table was a contingency. So there, yeah. there are situations where I think you can make it publicly available and we have in Data Shop and our IRB has been uh, okay with that. We've had some attempts, friendly attempts that de-identification and, and have fixed some issues uh, in relation to those. But I think if there's no demographic data, there's no record data, there's no discussion board data where self-identification is possible, and you're talking about clickstream kinds of data interactions in an educational game or, or a, a tutoring, online tutoring system, uh, I think we can make that data publicly available for research, and we have, and so far so good. And in the conditions which you keep adding in all these other variables. Then you restrict access. So right. it's a scale. Or a exactly. Yeah. Right. But I mean, just to follow up on that, that is a tension right there, Zach. I mean, would Berkeley let you release those data? You'd say they're not PII. And they'd say, but we're not so comfortable yet. Is that, is that kind of how it's playing out? Uh, if I wanted them to release, which 
The, the data that you're using for your studies, you, you said that, and I, I think that's one definition of personally identifiable information where it's like, you know, there's, there's no demo, socio-demographic variables, um, it's very difficult to, to link, but maybe theoretically possible with combinations um, unimaginable. Um, but, but I mean, if, if you can make the argument to Berkeley that it's not PII, what would stand in the personal identifiable information? Yeah. What would stand in the way of, of you saying, I'm going to release this, and why don't they say, sure, go ahead? Uh, to the public. Yeah, yeah uh, so um, I'm plotting to push them in that direction. Um, so if you have this kind of learner process data that has not yet been publicly released in MOOCs, as you know, uh, it is very personal in that it doesn't take very many clicks until that student's particular sequence of clicks is completely unique to them. Right. Um, however, uh, when an IRB looks at risk to the human subjects, it's not strictly uh, risk of re-identification. Re-identification in itself is not necessarily a harm uh, unless student has been promised otherwise. But they will look to say, OK, well, what is the risk of re-identification? And if re-identification did occur, what is the demonstrable harm? Um, arguably in MOOCs where it's voluntary, voluntary and not part of a, a degree program, it's much lower stakes than an educational record that's part of your transcript, right? Um, so uh, we'll see. I, I would at the very least, we'll try to get them to release a version of the data set that's completely tokenized, right? Where resources are translated into integers, right? Um, and it's just a series of integers representing every student's sequence at that, and no timestamps, right? And no discussion posts, but for the sake of perhaps replicability. We've got a two-person queue here so far, uh, Constance and then Adam in the back. Anybody else? And then over here. Uh, just quickly, I want to remind us that uh, I notice many of our examples are coming from MOOCs and voluntary contacts with adults, and things change dramatically when you talk about children and compulsory education. And the example given earlier about having to opt in to HIPAA release, right, well, the opting out is incredibly consequential. As someone who studies games, I can tell you when they become compulsory, it's a whole different ball of wax. So I just want to remind us that I, um, to maybe uh, be cognizant of where we're pulling our examples, I, I think um, I'll, I'll leave it there, actually. A couple of observation to couple of observations to connect this panel with the last one. Uh, it's often a criticism is often raised, and in fact, it was in the last panel that administrative data consists of a series of dependent variables with no independent variables. And in response to that question, some of the panelists pointed out ways where there are independent variables and contextual variables, and so allow for richer analyses th with administrative data than are often. Um, uh, imagined. Here, the criticism is often the opposite or the converse, that the learning process data is a series of independent variables or a series of predictors with no dependent variable. And yet, the presentations this morning have shown that indeed there's rich information on outcomes that can be gleaned from the learning process data. Uh, so I think very promising on both sides. Uh, imagine how much more powerful the evidence could be if the administrative data and learning process data were linked so that one could monitor uh, both at the same time. Yeah, I, I talked very fast, but two of my examples did involve outcome data. One was reasonably short term, like end of chapter kind of outcome data, but the other was state testing data. That was a, a special uh, opportunity that, uh, uh, you know, is not easy to replicate. So. I asked that question, and it was for exactly this reason, is to push us towards thinking about how can we achieve more linkage across these two sources. It certainly wasn't meant as a criticism of administrative data. I think this is exactly right. We have to figure out how to connect those two, because they're going to be most powerful when we have, when we have both. 
Right, and the other thing that needs to be said there is that for some kinds of analysis, a data point along the way in the process will be an outcome, and yet for other analysis, that will be a predictor uh, of a, a more distal outcome. Yeah, right, uh, and over here, uh, Marie. So I guess I should have jumped in earlier because I had exactly the same question. Actually, after the prior panel, I was wondering um, and reminded of one of the ambitions of In Bloom really being to link the administrative data to the learning process data. And can you mention that in your talk, but I think you're not going as far to the administrative data grain size as the prior panel was talking about, so you're not linking it to you know, college attendance or college completion or anything like that. So are there any examples where, you know, we've really done this sort of coarse grain size to fine grain size analyses? So I'll state all the data that we capture, whether from an LMS or a publisher system or attendance clicker system or um, visiting a financial aid office or an academic advisor or tutor is tied to all the grades and all the persistence and all the completion data, and we're in fact trying to then tie it to economic data post-graduation. Because without tying those activities right. to the long-term outcomes, you're not able to really judge the impact to the individual. And so is that data, but that's not K through 12 data, it's right? 12, it's, it's not 12, the compulsory, it's, college data, it's yes. college data. So it's a little bit, little bit different. And also it's not um, in a public database, right? It's in a private Companies it's database. A private companies database, but one of the things that we've done in the past and we want to continue to do as long as we can have it is that we have shared it with researchers after anonymizing it because we feel like being able to get more support on our data sets so that you can learn more is incredibly important. We simply don't know enough about how these connections, so we want to share our data as long as it's with qualified researchers that once again honor our contractual agreements. And when those data are anonymized, just to follow up, uh, do they do they have enough information about that that you could really link the administrative type data that we've been talking about with learning process data at the level of the anonymized individual? <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, at some point, de-identification uh, creates uh, uh, lapses in in the capacity to link. But I take it that it's all linked in your databases. Is that right, David? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Other questions or comments? Uh, if I might comment that I, I think one of the things that, you know, we can already do this linking in a one-off way if we can talk to the right people and convince those state administrators to do extra work that puts them at risk, right? Uh, but I think if we can create infrastructures that make those processes smoother, there still may be a negotiation and an IRB, but that it can be mediated through a, you know, you know how to do it and you know where to go to get started. I think that'll help a lot and we'll see more of them if, yeah. if we can get there. And if you, and if you also do it without, um, in, in, you know, uh, letting people believe that a private company is gonna profit from it, which is what led to the downfall of In Bloom. Susan. So kind of a follow up to Marie's question about do we have the examples from the very fine grain to the course and melding them together? I think if, if it, one job is to convince people of the benefits of research, and in this case, linking data sets, um, can we surface the studies? I mean, Zach, your example of the different kinds of studies showing the different kinds of resources. So, you know, what are the advantages if you could add in other data to your PII data? Can we? Are there sufficient studies that examine the benefits of the kind of things researchers might ultimately want to do at larger scale? So I'll, I'll link to this one where we used yeah. the online, it was an assessment data okay. set uh, to predict uh, MCAS mm -hmm. uh, test scores. And the, the, the sort of bottom line result is building a predictive model from one year's data, so, so you're not overfitting, yeah. applying it to the next yeah. year, you, we, we're predicting MCAS scores with like a 0.84 correlation with those independent models. So it's a pretty powerful right. prediction, right? That that online interaction, and even in November, the prediction's reasonably reliable, right? You already know something about the, the outcome from that. And I can make a link available yeah, to that. Exactly. I am reminded of another colleague of ours, 
uh, Ryan Baker, I think yeah. has a data set where he did look at college attendance from process data, yes. maybe yeah, with the right. genetics cognitive tutor. But I'll, I'll try to find those, and I'll, I, I'll put the links in the document. Yeah, we uh, got a queue again. Uh, this gentleman here, Constance, and somebody else had a You mind if I jump Zach, in the... Zach wanted to get in on that question. Go ahead, Zach. Uh, so um, I just want to emphasize uh, the research intrigue of that endeavor in the context of MOOCs. So uh, very frequently we're looking uh, either down in the weeds at the learner process mm -hmm. data, right? What's happening click to click in the MOOC, um, or we're looking at the kind of macro level, right? What's happening across mm -hmm. courses? But very rarely do we look at both at the same time, right? Um, uh, taking into account outcomes in previous courses while also minding the, mac the micro level activities in each, right? Um, and what was the major of the student and what are their objectives and how does this all factor into the question? Um, part of the challenge is how do you represent all this information, right? Representation is huge and that's kind of why I ended on uh, some advances in representation in machine learning. Um, for learning this representation as opposed to doing feature generation, fi trying to figure out ahead of time what's important to add features of. Instead, represent learner process data as the raw sequential information rather than an aggregate of that. Okay, this, this gentleman here. Uh, uh, and then Constance and then Liz. personal information hash with MD5 hashes, which has been broken for at least eight years. Um, I see this on a very regular basis in data sets coming from large research organizations and universities who actually have an obligation to know better, but, but haven't. So as we're talking about doing this, uh, I would love to hear what steps we're actually going to be putting in place to make sure that we're actually doing what we say we're doing and doing as well and doing that across organizations, not just isolated cases within labs. Um, and the second related question is I think we have two tiers of data here, at least two tiers of data. Um, and one of the things that frequently, that frequently gets left out is learner data from SIS is within the community college space, which is just as sensitive as anything you're gonna be getting from the MOOC, but if you look at the way people handling that data are trained, that they treat that as an administrative task and not a research task. And the training that people have with this data set that affects 51% of people actually in higher education in the States is nowhere even close to what is a very inconsistent training that we have, I think, within the research space. So how are we actually going to be stepping up our game to make sure that we have consistent coverage, not just in research data sets, but in the data sets that really cover the information of pretty much every other kid in the, uh, in the country going to higher education? I'll, I'll address the first part of your question. Um, we actually, in DataShop, originally did use a hashing approach to do anonymization of student identifiers, but uh, we... It was credible. Part, yeah, well, with a big enough computer and enough time, it is uh, somewhat crackable. But what we have now gone to is completely random identifiers and a random association map and no hashing, which means you can't backward retrieve the those, but you can store that if you have appropriate IRB approval in the background, right? And if then somebody later comes and wants to do linking and can get IRB approval to do that linking, we, we still have those, that original mapping. But if you go to DataShop now, all those identifiers, and please come and check and try to crack it. Uh, somebody actually did this and sent a very polite message at one point saying, <laughs> I've done a little cracking. You know, he had found 10 out of 1,000 identifiers so far, but, uh, um, and, we, and we fixed that. But uh, yeah, there might be other ways in which things leak. And I, don't, you know, I think we know from the literature that 
there's no perfect scheme for this, right? Uh, whenever you think you have one, somebody comes along and finds a way, right? But we, so we just have to be vigilant. About the second issue, just having negotiated 300 contracts, um, what I know is that states are having an increased focus on data security, both for employees and for third parties. And they're starting to make sure that those parties have appropriate security training every year, and that they are doing a better job, and it's very state specific. So I think, in general, things are moving in the right direction. But one of the advantages of all these kind of administrative systems is that less people are sending spreadsheets around, and that the functions are actually in the secure web and providing the results that you want. And so there's less manipulation. But that's not that's still not a solution. It's about appropriate training. Well, I think a lot of people also, in practice, sidestep. They'll just do an export out and then send a spreadsheet. So the, in short, but anyway, we're getting into the secure web. Yeah. Is your comment related to this question? Because otherwise, I'll go on to another yeah. prison. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I just wanted to add, um, there we go. Mics are working again. Um, <laughs> when we think about training, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that there is training we've had about 450 bills introduced in 49 states on student data privacy, about 84 of which have passed, and two of them mention training. It, there is very, very little focus on the fact that following laws or even entering data is associated, and well, I know many of you are affiliated with higher ed institutions, which have a little more focus because they're handling financial and a little more health data than K-12 sphere would, um, the level of sensitive data and the lack of training is pervasive throughout the entire system. Another quick factoid there is that no college of teacher education has a course on privacy. So it, it, again, training here is a, is a huge gap, and I definitely would be careful of assuming that that exists anywhere. Interesting. And my comment was specifically around colleges and universities. Yeah. OK, um, uh, we're with Constance and then Liz Albro. I was wondering if you could speak to the issues of, um, around um, collaboration between private uh, data sets and university organizations, university researchers, and also what kind of safe measures and oversight there is on the private side for data and data use? Um, so the good thing I find is that there are some states that are much better at these issues than others. And as a corporation, we tend to um, follow the states that are most rigorous. And we implement the policies we're being asked to. And therefore, all the other states benefit. So California and Illinois and Texas, whether it's um, you know accessibility for ADA issues or student privacy are really often out there years ahead. Um, but each organization, so I, I, you know, I can speak for ours, but each organization follows sort of what practices they, they need to do. But they're, is internally just sort of rigorous distinction between who has access, who needs access to the data, and who does not need access. Um, making sure there is appropriate training, appropriate security, securing of PCs, just the fact that you can't take data away, and that your phone and your PC, or do you have student data on that? It's just, you know, that kind of education can be enlightening for some. Um, and I think really cracking down the number of people that have access. Um, ultimately, when you share with third parties, you have to be clear that they follow themselves appropriate security procedures. So even if you do share de-identified data, and that means literally stripping out every, we still share demographic information and all, but stripping out any comments, any words, anything that a person might possibly type, right? Any name, any ID, that's all gets removed, but there's still the referential integrity, but making sure then the third parties have the appropriate security procedures just in case. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting is just how we ourselves need to understand um, what FERPA says, like how can a reasonable person um, handle this? So for example, we shared our large data set with University of Virginia Research, the Department of Education there, and we realized one of our customers had 23 colleges and 300,000 students. So one of the things we predict is even who the colleges are. So we said we simply can't include that in this data set because it would be too obvious to know that that was that particular school. So you really want to do per attribute, 
is this information able to be determined, you know, who the institution, who the individual is? So those are some of the techniques that we follow. Um, and once again, our data sharing is pretty limited to qualified researchers. A, a good uh, point to make there is that um, de-identification operates at many levels, not just at the level of the individual. Um, just this is just a quick heads up to David Figlio, to Sophia, and to Constance that at the end of this session, before we go to lunch, I'm going to call on each of you for a possible question to put to our lunch groups that uh, will be, um, you know, we're, we're, if you look at the back of your uh, uh, name tag, you'll find that you have been, you have a lunch table identifier, right? Yeah, and, and you can't be de-identified de for lunch. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so uh, 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 be thinking about questions that you might want to put to us as sort of uh, guiding questions for our lunchtime discussions. And now, uh, I'm sorry, Ken. Just, just a quick comment on uh, Steve Ritter at Carnegie Learning, which was our Cognitive Tutor spinoff, has been very generous uh, with contributing data. A lot of data f uh, from Carnegie Learning is in Data Shop. Uh, uh, so that's the good news, and I, you know, I think they've taken some risk. It's, it's, it's very de-identified, no demographics, no school inf information either, which is another issue that could, uh, could be at risk. I think maybe the one concern is that that data has been collected with informed consent at the school level, right, when they use the product, and some people think that that's not the right level to do it. Uh, uh, so there, there is another issue that needs to be thought through there. Thanks, everyone. Um, I want to go up a couple of levels here. Um, so many of you might be aware that the Office of Science and Technology Policy has put out a public access to data that comes from research call, right? So IES now has a data access policy in place, um, which right now is limited to uh, findings that come out of causal inference studies. But we're thinking a lot about thinking forward, right? So I guess when it, we're talking a lot about uh, problems at the end of a research study, but one of the things we're thinking about is how do we think about, um, how do our researchers think about preparing data that can be shared in the future to someone who we haven't identified? And the discussion about linking across administrative data systems and learning process data systems raises a lot of um, unanswerable questions at this point, right, in terms of how do you actually do that? So if we want to have administrative data from a K-12 system, there are rules that FERPA sets in place that says this data must be destroyed at the end of the research project, yet we're being asked, we the research community are being asked to, to share data. Um, it was originally in perpetuity. In our policy, we shifted it to 10 years. Um, but, but the idea is we think that by pulling data together across different data sets, we're going to be able to answer questions that we don't yet know the answer to. But when we originally do either IRB consents from the learning processes side or think about the agreements we set in place with states around that, there are a whole set of issues around this that are going to make it very, I mean, we just have to think about it. And I just wanted to put that on the table now. Because um, I think it's really easy for us to think about all these excellent questions that we could answer if we could merge administrative data with learning process data. But I think at least in the K-12 space, the ability to do that is much more complicated than we've really addressed. So it was more a comment than a question. But just one, and I think one quick response is yeah. I think we've learned that uh, it's important, that, and I, I, I think Rick can say the same, is that to educate researchers on the way to write their IRB protocols mm -hmm. to make sharing possible down the road. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. that's really important. And IRB officials at universities. Yeah. There and then there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Menzies. I'm with Civitas Learning. And uh, something that was said in the previous panel discussion I think relates to this and something directly to what Zach had said. Um, we had talked a little bit about is there a need for a clarification in FERPA? And I think someone said, no, clarification isn't really the word that we're looking for there. But Zach's comment on, hey, so far so good with the data that I put out there, really <laughs> does uh, resonate with me because um, Civitas has a lot of customers and universities that provide us data, and we're stewards of that data and we have to protect it. Um, what ends up happening, though, is different universities have different understandings of what and how that data can be used in these aggregate data sets that we're talking about. 
And really in the information that you presented up, I think a lot of our customers or a lot of our partners would consider that that would not be de-identified data. And even on the DOE's website, on the Techno Technical Assistance Center, there's papers there that even make comments of, with computing resources available and primary and secondary identifiers, can we really consider any, any data set that's useful to be de-identified? And I think that's the question that I would like to everybody to take to lunch, is what, what do we consider to be truly de-identified data that we can use or that we can present in a public forum that isn't just a large aggregate of data, but really useful individual line item data? Uh, so one way to address that question is uh, there's, I, I think about sharing of data um, with two different thresholds. One is if you're going to make it public, you have to meet FERPA's threshold of um, de-identified. And that threshold is pretty high in, in Andrew's draft. He expresses it as an extreme threshold, uh, right? If you have the best computer scientists in the world hacking at it, can they not re-identify it? Um, whereas the threshold for de-identified that your IRB has is lower. And it's not because they have less game than the uh, FERPA evaluators. It's because the incentives for PIs at your institution to behave is there, right? They should behave ethically. Their job depends on it. They have a reputation. So when it comes to, well, what is de-identified enough, if you have personal MOU agreements with personnel researchers at your university, it is sufficient for you not to have obvious identifiers in the data. And those researchers have agreed not to try to learn those back. But if we're talking about making data public, and maybe that's part of linking, then I don't know how you answer that. If you think about a, a thought experiment, let's say you're a FERPA evaluator, you're the registrar, and I propose to you that I'm going to encrypt student social security numbers and their full names with encryption algorithm X and then I'm gonna post it publicly on the web. How do you evaluate if that's um, foolproof enough against re-identification, right? Where I vary X algorithm, right? At, so, I mean, is it a futile process to even talk about that? I, uh, I lost my cue, but go ahead there. <laughs> if you were in the, oh, Rick, 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 Rick was next, and then, then you. Sorry. I had more of a clarification question for David. I think I missed something. When you're talking about 23 schools and not identifying them, was that to protect the schools or the individual students? That was to protect the schools. Part of our contractual agreement states when we do use the data that our clients have allowed us to be stewards for, for research purposes, that we make sure both students and schools would not be um, discoverable. So that, that's the, what I thought you were saying, and that's what some states do also, that you can't identify individual districts or schools. Is that a legitimate concern? If you have a public institution, um, why shouldn't we know the information about public institutions? Why should we protect that? Well, as a, as a, as a but no, as a private individual, I understand if you're- well, as an individual that simply wants Mike. to it's, I'm having trouble making it work. If people can turn off their mics, the more mics that are on, the less others will work. So it's a more pragmatic thing. Because we want to share with qualified researchers this data so they can help us understand best practices, not so that we can benefit, but the entire new product category can benefit, we knew institutions object to being embarrassed in public or even in private, not in public, I should say, but in private settings. So we simply wanted to remove the obstacle that discouraged the institution from sharing their data, which is to expose them. So in a broader so, context, I'm so not sure So let me sure bring it perfect. back to yeah. um, the state of California that does not want any district identified, identifiable ever in any research situation. Is that a legitimate um, kind of request, or does that fall into um, this range of pure politics where we're going to protect these institutions? I'd vote no. 
We'll just have to wait for a, a change in the governorship of California. <laughs> um, sir. Rick Gilmore at Penn State and also with the Databury Digital Library. Uh, I just wanted to mention, sort of following up on Zach's reply to the previous question, that uh, at Databury, we've actually, we're, our focus is storing audio and video, primarily video recordings. Um, and in that case, we've taken the approach that it is possible to store and share from, research, from researchers to researchers clearly identifiable data. And I'm happy to talk with some of you who are interested in that, in that policy framework and that model for doing so. So it is possible to do. Uh, again, it, it builds upon informed consent. And it seems to me that, that it's worth knowing that that's possible uh, in the conversation that we're talking about here. Because the more I, th I think and hear about de-identify de data, so-called, and particularly with the, the, the value of linking data sets, I get w I'm, I'm worried that we're making promises we can't really deliver on, but where with a promise of two participants that we're going to do our best to protect your identities, but we're not going to say that it's anonymous. That, that's a promise I feel more comfortable keeping. Happy to talk about that separately. Just to add a little bit, I think Databury has a very interesting model for, uh, is along the lines of my comment to Marie, is coordinating how a researcher can gain access and essentially, if I, if I remember right, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially you have to be at an institution that's been approved, that their IRB is approved, and then you get approved through your IRB in connection to the other researchers who produce the data in their IRB. So it sounds like a sort of uh, network of trusts, right? And in that network, these kind of linkages are possible. Um, I'm Jeff Rodemar, Department of Education. Just like to mention something for your radar. As you may know, there have been major changes to the common rules that have been proposed, which is where the IRBs that have been much discussed are rooted. The NBRM laid out in section 105 that if you've even if you've got data from surveys etc that are both identifiable and sensitive you would not need irb review under what's being considered at this point so long as you were following data confidentiality standards to be developed by the secretary of hhs in consultation with the other common rule agencies and with public comment and so looking down the road in terms of what those standards are going to look like and how they get implemented, assuming that this change takes place, may be of interest to this group. That's very useful to know. Um, well, we're um, coming up close to, to our um, uh, lunchtime break uh, back here. Hi, I'm Monica Bolger. I have a question. I've been. Um, it's been good that we've been addressing the challenges of the data set, so what's missing, and we talked about randomized trials and that sort of thing, but we really haven't talked about how the tech is, is leading what we're able to research. So we're only able to measure the data points that the tech is measuring rather than us deciding what the tech is measuring, it seems, in our discussion. And so I think that that's something we should raise and be concerned about because as researchers, what are we missing from that data that we really need to have in order to you know, be making decisions about interventions and implementation? Yeah, I guess one thing that I'll highlight related to that is I'm going to chip away at some of the 90% of cleaning data because when you're cleaning garbage, you still <laughs> get garbage, right? And, uh, but clean and I think well, one of the challenges with process data, and I've seen it uh, literally hundreds of times, I think, uh, is that the, when, the, when you write logging code in your product, uh, there's a lot of subtle decisions that get made 
and you don't realize that you're missing X or Y until you do analysis and then you go, gee, I wish in that online text we had recorded scrolling, for example, because uh, there's multiple pages to read and we can't tell which page they're looking at and for how long other than the, the link, just to give one recent example. Uh, and I think that's, that's a huge issue, right? And that, that somehow, we, 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 well, we can be sharing uh, logging libraries, and we, we do have a logging library uh, in, in DataShop, for example, that, will, that you can attach to your software, so it'll export in that format. But I, I think that there, we need more of that, because otherwise the quality of the process data isn't going to be great. Uh, and we need more research coding, labeling, this is the deep part of what I was saying, is uh, of that process data, right? I think if we just run black box machine learning algorithms, we'll kind of get what we get, which is a better prediction, but no insight. Uh, so one um, effort there that I don't know if people know about, so the IMS, which imsglobal.org, is an education standards organization that's helped e-learning really thrive but they have introduced in the last two and a half years a caliper standard that helps to have a more systematic way of tracking this process or activity data, both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. And my hope there is that um, those standards will evolve within the data architecture so that we can then share more of that. But that kind of standardization, which takes a long time, is critically important. My hope is that you would all get involved at some point with that IMS caliper project. So I have a shameless plug about that. The uh, chair of the working group for IMS caliper is a co-author on a journal article that's out at uh, 2016 called MOOC RP. Uh, and uh, we've incorporated edX profile into the caliper standard, so MOOC events and vocabulary. And you can look, uh, the article gives some uh, information on the differences between tin can slash XAPI and caliper and some actual concrete examples of this is what a caliper event looks like compared to XAPI if um, you're interested in looking at it. Okay, well, um, we're um, easing up uh, uh, on our lunch hour. And um, for, um, but let me uh, first thank uh, all of our panelists for their great insights. And let me also thank uh, our attendees for all of their um, uh, insightful uh, and provocative uh, questions. I think that uh, it's been a, a great session with a, a lot of uh, interesting ideas raised and we'll get a chance to uh, continue the conversation at l lunch. Let me uh, uh, say a special thank you to um, uh, to David. Uh, David uh, Yaskin was indeed recruited yesterday because the person who was supposed to represent, uh, you know, the um, uh, private sector on this panel had uh, had a, a, a personal emergency, and and a Amy um, Berman, through her persuasive powers, uh, was able to uh, 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 w was able to persuade David to participate. And, and we've it's been uh, very very useful to have you uh, on this panel today, David. But let's thank all of our panelists for a, a wonderful <laughs> session. And now, uh, David Figlio and, um, and Sophia and um, Constance, uh, do you have a, um, a, a question uh, to share uh, that might uh, help uh, frame the lunchtime conversations at your table, at the tables? Many, but I'll stick with one. Um, so I'd like to shift the conversation from susceptibility of data to the appropriate uses of su such data. We know uh, Andrew Ho used the example of InBloom and the idea that one of the problems they ran into was the under-specificity of how these data would actually help uh, instruction and interventions. So I would love to see lunchtime discussion that was around um, how do we think about the cost-benefit analysis, so getting more specific about privacy concerns in relation to what kinds of cost-benefit analyses in a way that's actionable. Okay, Sophia or David? I'm not sure if this is too closely related to Constance's question. I was thinking about um, it was meant the, the problem was raised of having ensuring different levels of de-identification or um, confidentiality, and because there's this trade-off between data quality and confidentiality issues, 
Um, and I think also there are different levels of um, public availability, like making it freely downloadable on the web or requiring you know, approval institutions and IRB review and um, training, et cetera. So it's kind of matching the two and maybe defining, so it's coming up with definitions of you know, what level of um, the identification might be needed for what kind of public, in quote, use. <laughs> Yeah, well, you stole my question, uh, Sophia. Oh. But, uh, uh, my, my version of the question is, what's the sweet, sp the sweet spot in the de-identification process where you've de-identified de enough uh, to balance the privacy issues on the one hand, but not so much that you've uh, sort of obliterated all the useful um, mediator and moderator uh, kind of explanations of uh, whatever learning variables you're looking at? But David Figlio, what's yours? All right. Um, um, given the questions we just heard, I figure I'll, I'll throw uh, slightly, uh, I'll throw a little curveball in there. Um, so this morning, pretty much everything we've been talking about has been what I would consider policy and practice oriented applied research. Um, I would like us to, uh, I would love it if people could talk a little bit about what's the appropriate role for basic research that could end up um, uh, potentially revolutionizing policy and practice in ways we don't yet know. Um, and how, how does that fall into the, contribute to this conversation? Great. Well, um, uh, I will uh, raise um, uh, one other question, I, and this is um, uh, related to the ones we've, we've heard about so far. And uh, it's a personal question because I've spent most of my life doing one form or another of experimental or quasi-experimental research. And one of the things that I realize is just how costly it is and how hard, particularly when you get to the level of randomized control trials, how difficult it is to implement them. And one of the hopes I've always had for big data or these, these very systematic data sets is that we could learn a lot about uh, educational practices and the promise of new educational practices uh, you know, in, in a much more cost-effective way than is possible through randomized control trials. Uh, and the question I have is, uh, you know, what would be sort of the optimal relationship between um, uh, the kind of work we've been talking about today and, um, and, and um, true experimental research? And, you know, what could, could there be some symbiotic relationship between the two enterprises? And that was my uh, question for today. So, Amy, um, uh, any uh, special advice about what we ha what's going to happen here at lunch? <laughs>